Welcome everybody, it's Lisa from Quilting in the Valley. Here we are with episode seven of QITV. Today we're gonna to feature Jeremy from Benertex and he's gonna show us all about the differences in fabric substrates. You'll learn more later. We're also gonna do good, better, best with pins. Yes, pins, there are better pins. And we're gonna do a quick tutorial out on the sales floor, show you the ends of bolt boards and help you understand how to identify what it is you're looking at. Everybody, this is our first segment of this particular show, and we're going to visit with Jeremy from Benertex. Jeremy, how do you do? Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. It is fun. So, tell me about how you got into the fabric industry. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to remove my mask. Thanks to the wonders of modern science, we'll be safe. Uh, this is made from one of the Benertex batiks, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, I've been in the business about 30 years. I started okay. off, I was very fortunate that um, Tim Reed and Patty Reed, who created Daisy Kingdom all those years ago. I remember Daisy Kingdom. Yeah, it was a great line and very good times. Uh, I always wondered what happened to all those little girls in the toilet yeah. dresses. <laughs> um, I thought they'd show up on Oprah trying to sue their parents for cruelty, maybe. I don't know. But, <laughs> they were uh, cute. They were very <laughs> cute. cute. And it was a good time to be in the fabric business back then. Uh, but that's how I got my start. Okay. And um, one thing led to another. The company was sold on to a larger company. And I was able to move with that company and uh, worked with some of the key big box stores over the years. Um, and then since then, um, some years ago, I worked for a much smaller company again, a family o uh, owned and orientated uh, company and decided to hire quilters to sell the line uh, because sometimes... Um, Good idea. You know, yeah, we, I, it was very successful because the quilters were on a perpetual shop hop and they were getting paid to do it. Of course they were. They made their own samples. <laughs> sounds like a dream job. It does, <laughs> yeah. doesn't it? So, um, I would do that job. <laughs> and they would talk one-on-one -on -one with you as opposed to perhaps somebody throwing a bunch of stuff out on the right. table and waiting to write an order. So that turned out to be a very, very successful business model. It was actually, uh, that company was since sold to one of our competitors now. The, one of the reasons was because they wanted a dedicated, engaged sales force. And uh, that seems to be the way business is going in our industry as well, um, which is an interesting so, trend. Ladies, do you hear that? If you want a job, Get a hold of a fabric company. Okay, sorry. <laughs> good, good plug, good plug. And Benetex Canvassing Tempo would be a great company to work for. There you go. Um, I've worked for them now. I'm in my sixth or seventh year. I'm not sure. And the nice thing about Benetex is that we have never sold to the big box stores um, or anybody else like that. So let me clarify uh, that. Yes. So a lot of other companies have pretty much the same fabric, but they make it in two different qualities. Yes, and there's a lot of confusion around that, both at the consumer level and with a lot of store and independent fabric sellers and retailers, both online and brick and mortar, like Quilting in the Valley. When sometimes those different substrates, as they're referred to, are combined in a quilt or a, a project, you can get sometimes puckering, the yeah. fabric may fade at a different rate, it may sag or hang differently over time, and if you're building a quilt or if you're building a product that is going to become a family heirloom or something that you're going to gift to a friend or family or loved mm -hmm. one, you know, it doesn't make sense to cut corners or to take a risk thinking that, well, oh, I'll save a couple of dollars here. Right. I'll, I'll purchase this over here instead of from my independent uh, fabric seller or machine dealer. And uh, to me, it doesn't make sense. I am actually a quilter, not a very good one. I'm still <laughs> a beginner after all these years. Um, I sew on an old machine and I primarily sew with batiks because I find them much more forgiving. Hence they the, don't stretch. Hence the little, well, that's one thing too. Yeah. Um, but going back to your thing about quality, um, for quilting, there are, for the quilter, and um, over-the-counter fabric uh, stores, there are typically two different substrates. And the substrate simply refers to the construction of the fabric, right. the weft and the warp. Sure. Um, and uh, we always have a little fun with stores and consumers uh, at trade shows to, to know which the weft and the warp are. Um, I can never remember. Yeah, it, there's a very easy way to I know to one remember. goes one way and one goes the other way. <laughs> That's very true. Um, so the warp is always the vertical okay. and the weft is the horizontal. Okay. And a very easy way to remember that, I actually have a, a little uh, thing made up here which we can uh, show the camera. Okay. So this shows the, the warp here and the weft here. 
Now, the, the easy way to remember this is that the weft, you can say two ways, either goes from weft to white, Oh, goodness. Which is what some, okay. my, my, one of my sales ladies <laughs> right. uh, taught me All that right. years ago. Uh, but the, easy, the, the more sensible way to remember it is weft is west, so east-west. Okay. So that's the horizontal. So that's a great way to that remember the weft and the warp. I probably will remember now. I think you will. Weft, <laughs> weft is west. Weft is west. Yep. All right. So that's the construction of the fabric. So the two substrates are a 60 by 60, which means 60 vertical weft. Uh, sorry, warp and 60 so weft. threads. Threads per inch. Mm -hmm. So the thread count refers to threads per inch. Right. So 60 by 60 means this, you know, 30 and 30. And they, you multiply, or well, you add the two together to, to get the thread count. And then the second substrate, which you see, is the 68 squares. Okay. Which is 68 by 68. So I won't put you on the spot, but I always ask this of store owners, which one do you think is the better quality? And most consumers and store owners think the higher thread count is better. Automatically think, right. of, and that you think of bedding. Yeah, that's because, how they market sheets. Exactly. So yeah. back in 2000, the bedding companies back then, the Wamsutters and all these, the big guys. Thousand threads per inch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was a little bit misleading, and it still is today. It was a way to market and to differentiate their fabrics, uh, the sheeting, um, from their competitors. So they implied that a much higher thread count was actually a better quality. Right. And it was but a bit from of, my understanding, it's not actual thread. It, it is and it isn't. And it's, that's where the quilters yeah. get confused. Because like if you went to perhaps a Walmart store, you might see a 200 thread count bed sheet and think, oh, that's nice. And then you go to a Macy's and you see a 300 thread count bed sheet. Right. And then if you go to the city and you go to a boutique store, you might see a 600 or 800 thread count. Or even, or like even I've seen higher. Up to 1,000, yeah. And it's, it's marketing gone a little silly, really. Yeah. Um, and it confuses the customer when you're talking about quilting fabrics. But what's actually happening is the, the way they're getting that higher thread count, Lisa, is instead of a single strand of cotton, which is a, a, the, you know, the, the long thread. grain cotton, which what is one thread. What most of us would call one thread. Yes, exactly. Okay. And um, what the bedding companies are doing is they're twisting shorter cotton pieces together and counting all of them forcing it into that inch <laughs> and counting each one of those individual yep. strands so it's a multiply uh, cotton versus a single strand cotton yep. and that's why you know it it's a, feels different and so on and so it forth it feels rougher it, it does and uh, but it's made a lot of money for the bedding companies yeah. now i'm not saying that you, you buy what you like and if you prefer a thousand thread count then and that feels fine then that's good yeah. but also there are different finishes that those companies will put on like a polishing and calendaring which is different ways to adjust how the fabric feels. But, um, but for quilters, um, the answer, as you alluded to, of course, Lisa, is the 60 square is typically the best. Okay. And the, the average consumer is not going to be able to go into a store and, and say, is this 60 squares <laughs> or is it 68? And sometimes customers won't know. Um, unfortunately, some manufacturers choose to print what appears to be the same printed cloth. Right. On, on two different substrates, right. and you can figure out why they do that. Uh, but the problem is, is occasionally the consumer may pick up one quality in one store and another quality in another store to save a little money or for whatever reason. And unfortunately, what happens is um, you, you don't get a great result. Right. And it's all about reading the register. So I've got some samples here of what a register is. So here's a, a fabric that uh, Benetex put out by Jackie Robinson. Okay. And you can see here, these are the registers. And each one of these so registers, these right the little here. round circles, yes. And each one of those contains a Pantone shade, mm -hmm. uh, a specific Pantone shade. And now, then, just Pantone. Pantone is the company that governs uh, and assigns a number to every shade. Did y'all know that? There's an official regulatory body that determines what <laughs> colors are. Who knew? Uh, well, anyway. Pantone. <laughs> Pantone. Pantone, yeah. <laughs> okay. In fact, last Thursday, Pantone just announced the, the colors new color for, next for year. 2021. And that color, well, if they're going to do two colors. They're going to do a mid gray and what they call a, a vibrant yellow. Okay. And um, so because everybody wants a little bit of happiness and, well, of course and sunshine in our lives, we, we? we definitely need that. So, but each one of these registers, Lisa, contains a Pantone shade. And that is, this is the, the life and the birth of the fabric. This mm -hmm. tells you everything that you need to know. And the important thing is for the consumer um, is to look at this because this is printed in the salvage. 
So the salvage is this little white stripe, and typically on a fabric, there are two salvages, one on each side. And the purpose of salvage is to stop the fabric from fraying. So it's a slightly different weave at right, the end here. And you can see it's, it's a little bit tighter and there's a, a stitching sort of finish down the side. But on one side of the salvage on a printed piece of goods will be the name of the manufacturer, perhaps the mm -hmm. name of the designer. Right. There's a little it disclaimer. Says, it, well, you can't see it all, but it would say right. Jack, Jackie Robinson. Of exactly. Here's a better example. This is one of our glow in the dark fabrics. And this is from our canvas studio. There you and go. you can see here it's Everything. called All Systems Glow, not intended for sleepwear. And here we're getting a little bit cute, as a lot of the companies do. It makes it a little bit more fun for the consumer. This one is done as stars because well, this is a. And one of the great things to do with these, because you're not going to use this, you're going to cut this off, obviously, before mm -hmm. you put it in your quilt. But a lot of ladies are saving these and then sewing them together and right. making a whole other fabric. And it's adorable. You can make little perches and pouches and just cute things. In, in fact, I've, I saw a, a book, I think, in your store, which was called Salvage Project. Yeah. Salvage Quilts and Salvage Projects. So you, the people are doing like Pink Sand Beach, Lazy Girl, yes. Atkinson. Um, all these companies, Annie's cute. by Annie's is doing some great patterns. And you can adapt that just using the salvages. Yeah. So, now, now to get back to this, this thing with all of these colors, now, this is a screen printed fabric. So correct. each one of these means? There is a specific color laid down in that particular order to a maximum of 18 screens. So basically then what you're saying for a screen, so the fabric is stretched out on whatever they mm -hmm. screen on. And a, I'm assuming it's mechanized. Uh, yes. Goes over it one time for each of these. Well, typically the screens marks. are laid down on a wet bed printer, and the fabric is traveling underneath, and each screen lays down a color one after the other to we a maximum. We need to go there to see that. Yeah, I've been trying to do a trip out there. Somewhere, Can we do that? Let's go there and see that. I think we want to go fun, see that. Wouldn't it? And we'll film. We'll all go. <laughs> well, we're, the company that purchased uh, Daisy Kingdom all those years ago still did printing down in the Carolinas uh, and also down in Georgia. And I was fortunate enough back then to take customers in to see the mills. And that I would think be fun to see. At one point, I think one of the big print machines was several hundred feet long, and there was at least one mile of fabric within that machine because it started off as grage goods at the end, which sure. is the raw cotton before right. it's dyed or before it's uh, printed on. Um, and out the other end came a beautiful fabric. That would be fascinating. And then it was rolled onto a great big tube, and then the forklift truck would lift it off, and then it would go over to the Dublin rolling machine, which is what your customers see, the bolted goods. It's called right. Dublin rolling, where they fold it a 45 in half. and a half and wraps it around a board, doubled and rolled. And I've seen them put that on bolts where this, this thing, and it goes really fast, mm -hmm. and then it, it must count when it goes, yep. and it just stops, and then they... As the fabric is bolt. coming, yeah, as the fabric is coming down onto the bolt after it's folded, there's a magic eye, an electronic eye, right. which is reading how much fabric is going through uh, very, it's very insane. quickly. Yeah, so well, it's it's you know it's it's an old skill, and uh, we do at Benetex Canvas Contempo. Uh, we have our own warehouse up in Rhode Island, and we bring all of our goods in. ROT, which means rolled on the those great roll. big tubes, mm -hmm. and then the doubling and rolling process is all done in our own warehouse. Um, so we better quality control that way for us at least. Um, we believe that, that that's the right way to go. So now, if you were doing something like a basic here, this is the Benetex uh, Shadow Blush. These are typically two to four Pantone shades. So this may only have two or maybe three or four screens, mm -hmm. whereas a, a, a designer print will have up to 18 screens. And it's a max of 18. It's a maximum of 18. Okay. That's as big as the machines can print. Now, the important thing here is, and this is a, a photograph just showing a whole bunch of those salvages, mm -hmm. which again, you could cut up and make the projects we discussed just a moment ago. But the thing for the consumer to be very careful of, especially if they're discount shopping, is you want to make sure that those, all of those circles, all of those registers, as they're called, have a color in them. Because if you notice, this is a... Yeah, there's uh, five of them that are blank. Exactly. Now, mm -hmm. that could be for a number of reasons, but most of the time, it's not for a good reason. And we'll, okay. leave, it, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. So it, an educated cu customer and consumer is going to be a better customer for any, every fabric seller. So they're seller. just eliminating shading or something, probably. Well, each screen usually costs um, you know, up to $1,000 to engrave. So there's a, there's a cost saving there. But also sometimes a, a company may choose to sell a particular version of a fabric in one location right. and a different one here. So they're putting colors in or they're taking colors out 
The problem with that again is, unfortunately, the consumer may get caught because the fabric may not match. Even though right. if it looks to the consumer, it looks like, oh, it's the same fabric, and mm -hmm, but it's actually missing screen. So a very good uh, way for customers to um, pick out their basics is to look at these registers because these are the actual Pantone shades. Sure. So if they're looking for a solid, um, like a superior solid from Benetex or, or one of the other solids out there, or if they're looking for something like a blender basic, which has more than one color in it, um, this is a great way to hold these up against and you can then you can pick your coordinate right. fabric. So it's a great way to build your quilt and your coordinates by looking at those registers. But always make sure the other thing that's important um, I have some other ones here. This is just to show you, and I've blacked out the manufacturers. That's not important. But what's important here is see, there's no circles around this one. No, there's not. So it doesn't have to be quite as accurate. And then in this case here, you'll notice that one or two of those circles, they're not the, the colors are not actually within those circles. No, they're it's not. It's a minor thing, but if I'm spending $12 and up for a yard of fabric, I want to make sure I'm getting the very best I can get. And you can also see uh, it's a this little fuzzy. This little, yeah. And, and by the way, I, I have receipts. You can see you know, where I bought all of these fabrics. Um, so what are some other like quality indicators that people can look for when they're in the store shopping for fabric? That's an excellent question, Lisa. Actually, it's a lot of questions. Well, there you <laughs> all go. In all one. Right. <laughs> um, so very simply, the, f the easiest thing is, does the fabric feel good to you? The drape and you the hand. Touch, yeah, yeah, you touch the fabric. Does it feel soft and malleable? Does it have a nap to it? The, the nap is almost like with a flannel right. or a cashmere. You know, it has that sort of soft, fuzzy feeling. Right. A regular cotton, like this, even our, our, our regular quilted cotton, mm -hmm. it feels soft. You can yes. see that it's malleable and there's no stiffness. It's if, not felted, but right. if I were to say it's almost like it's felted, just, mm -hmm. just vaguely felted. It's exactly. a soft It has field. a soft hand, as it's right. called, or, or the nap of the fabric is soft. Some of the fabrics that have been on the market recently, especially in the big box stores, have felt rather stiff. Right. Uh, they're, they're all sort of congealy because it's a thinner fabric, typically. The metallics in and, particular. Oh, Well, my. not just the metallics or the glitters, but um, the, the fabric. I'm telling you, the metallics yeah. can stand on their own. <laughs> you cut them and you stand them up and they just stand there. <laughs> Maybe that would be, make a good bucket bag. There you go. <laughs> you good wouldn't need bag. starch. <laughs> you wouldn't need that bosal, uh, you know, the, yeah, the, the batting and the, the interfacing for that. That, would, that might be a, a new market. Marketing ploy, but um, <laughs> but what you know. So again, it comes down to sort of a little bit of common sense. Feel the fabric. Look at the fabric. Look at the registers. Do they right. all have colors in them? Are the colors directly inside the circle or right. the whatever shape they're using in the registers? Um, and here's another good uh, pull test. It, it doesn't matter whose fabric this is, but I've brought this along to show you because you know a lot of people have upgraded to good machines over the last six to twelve months. Yes. And especially folks on a long arm where, where fabric is under tension in both directions, right. you don't want to fabric, you see what's going on here? And I'm just doing this thumb and forefinger. You see that that fabric, a 44, 45 inch piece of fabric is stretching an extra two and a half to three and a half inches. Yes, That's going to cause all kinds of problems when it's under tension under any machine, regardless of the brand of machine, regardless of well, what the machine can do, but and especially I will tell in the long arm. What this will cause, forget the long arm. I'm going to tell you what this causes. And this is a common issue with a lot of ladies. You put your borders on and your borders go like oh, this. Yep. That's why. Mm -hmm. Well, you can get puckering, you can get yes. all kinds of issues there. So yeah, yeah that, that's another thing to look for. And, and really, um, and look, there are one or two uh, resellers of fabric, uh, both online and brick and mortar and machine sellers, who do sell premium fabrics um, at a slightly lower cost. But on average, um, and again, I'm a consumer, on average, we should expect to pay for a premium design of fabric, a new fabric that's on the market, around 12 to 12 dollars and 48 49 cents a yard mm -hmm. now you'll pay maybe a dollar or two less per yard for a solid or for a blender basic like the the benetex right. blush that we showed earlier and you'll typically pay about a dollar a yard more than that for a batik, a batik. fabric because of course that's a handmade right. uh, product and by the way I, i'm sure your listeners already know this and you've probably covered this in your in your um previous broadcast, but the batik fabric is not the 60 or 68 square fabric. Right. Batiks are actually made on uh, more of a shirting, like my shirt is made poplin. from. It's called a poplin, mm -hmm. exactly. And that's typically uh, a 133, 78 kind of construction, the weft and the warp. Um, but the nice thing about the batik fabric is it makes the best 
masks yes. out of all of the fabric substrates. Because it's denser. Because it's a denser. And what I've done with the ones I have is um, put, a, put a little pocket in there. And then, of course, nowadays we can get the, the paper filters and you drop right. the filter in there. And then you've got an extra layer of, of protection. Right. And when I've been traveling, I actually wear this. And then I was sent one by one of the airlines that I fly a lot. Uh, and I put that uh, over the top, which is a, just a bigger piece of fabric. Um, which is good because it's been getting me some upgrades. I think they, they think I work for the airline. <laughs> um, but the batik fabric is, is on a slightly different substrate. So when the customer is in the store, um, it's really important to uh, read the registers, feel the fabric, stretch on the fabric. You want for quilting or for any project, you want a stable weft and warp. The right. fabric needs to be stable. It shouldn't be moving around. It shouldn't stretch in different directions. And of course, that, that's what you get. Uh, from the primary right. uh, sellers of fabric. Okay, all right. So I wanna just throw a little word in here about pricing. So I know you mentioned the 12 to 1248, um, and that is probably a good, so like we're mostly 1199. It's an average. It's yeah. an average. We're yeah. mostly at 1199 here. Now I will tell you that the reason that I can hold 1199 here is because my rent and my overhead is not ridiculous. There are some places in the country where their rents and overhead, they're, they're just expenses to open mm -hmm. every day, whether they sell anything or not, they have to pay this much money, is way higher than ours. And in those places, they have to make up that difference somewhere else. So sometimes, depending on where you're going, you're right. mm -hmm. you may see some fabrics, $13.99, $14.99, and mm -hmm. that's, they have to do that to keep the doors open. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's a basic economics kind of a thing. You're going to see some difference in prices. Absolutely. Now, if you are in a, I'm not going to mention the name, if you are in a craft and fabric store <laughs> that is big and over a the- A big box store. A big box store. Mm -hmm. um, you will go into their quilting cotton section and you'll see that their regular price is marked $12.99. And actually, there's one where a lot of them are marked $14.99. Oh my gosh, I haven't mm -hmm. been in that one. All right. Yep. So, and the reason they do that is so that you can use your 60% off coupon. Ugh. <laughs> well, I tried that one time, and actually, it's it's 40% off, but you have to make sure that your phone has a signal to get the download. And right, there's a lot of things. Then you end up things. getting emails, you know, for candy for and all the other life. things. Yes. Um, your mother's yeah. maiden name and everything crazy. else. It, it's a It's a bit much, but um, most of those fabrics are typically on sale. Uh, at, a, at a lower than the 40%. Eight ninety nine. Well, but they don't apply. You can't apply those online discounts. And then you can't get the extra discounts. On those anyway. So yeah. I have found that um, the independent fabric shops, machine shops, and the online sellers sell at a very fair price every day without all the yeah. different applications and apps and, and you things know, you I need. will say, and I shouldn't say ladies. I, could, I should quit saying ladies. There's a lot more of us sewing now. Everyone. There really are. I'm, I'm going to stop saying ladies. That's terrible. <laughs> and I know some guys that are quilters, and I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. So we're not going to do that anymore. I'm going to say, hey, everybody. Anyway, um, I have been to literally hundreds of quilt shops because I am mm -hmm. addicted. So when I go someplace, I go to quilt shops. I just go, and I make it a point to buy something from every quilt shop I go to because I know how hard it is to stay in business. Yep. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I have not found one quilt shop that I thought was trying to price gouge. Absolutely not. One. Not. not one. Now. There's going to be a price difference if you buy full price fabric from an independent store and sale fabric from a box store. There's going to be a price difference, but mm -hmm. that stretchy fabric that he showed you is going to be your difference. So that's going to make all the world a difference in the outcome of your project. So just think about whether or not $2 a yard, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to use six to, six to 10 yards of fabric in a quilt on Typically, average. Yeah. So 10 yards of fabric, that's $20 extra. Mm -hmm. Isn't For a family heirloom, that's $20 yeah, extra. To make a family heirloom, it's money well spent. Yeah. But I think it goes beyond price though, Lisa. I believe, and I travel across the country in normal circumstances. I travel all over the country. I visit, I'm very fortunate. I'm on a perpetual shop up my yeah. entire career. That would be a dream um, job. And I'm fortunate. <laughs> I've visited over 2,000 stores in my career. Which is uh, okay. That's more than me. Yeah. <laughs> I have I have to catch up. Okay. I, it's not a competition. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. Um, but my point is, is especially the brick and mortars. Now I'm not discounting onliners or anything like that. They do a fantastic job. They have an, It's an easy way to shop sometimes, especially if you're in a rural area and there's no store around you. Right. But the brick and mortar stores, the machine dealers and the fabric salespeople, your store, all of the independent stores around America and around the world. 
they are community centers yes. for our hobby and for our passion. Yep. And you have to support a community center for it to stay around. Right. I saw a very interesting sign in a store out in Oregon uh, last summer. And it said, because of course some people walk around and they've got their phone and you know they might take a picture of a board end and see if they can find it somewhere else cheaper. Yeah. The signs around the store said, see it here, buy it here, keep us here. And I thought that was very relevant, especially in these times when a lot of it people are, are forced to go online. Yeah. But beyond that, I've always said, and you've heard me say this in the years that we've known each other, 50% of quilting is the social aspect. Right. It's the community spirit. Folks come to your store and all of the independent stores that offer classes and, and um, retreats and what have you, you meet folks that you don't see in the grocery store, that you don't mm -hmm. meet in church on mm -hmm. Sunday. Mm -hmm. You meet people with like-minded uh, views and values and a hobby. Yeah. And it's so rewarding. So many store owners have said to me over the years, you know, it's amazing. I said, you know, these ladies, they didn't know each other. And I found out they just came back from a retreat together, you know, and it's, it's that wonderful feeling of community. So we need to support our, our sellers of fabric and our machine dealers because we need somewhere where we can come collectively right. when things open back up again and where there is that social interaction where we, because when we come into a store like yours, we see new machines, we see new accessories, yeah. new notions, most importantly, new patterns. Right. Nothing happens in our industry until a consumer sees something hanging up or, or on the table that they want to make. Right. So we have to inspire, on, from the vendor side, we need to inspire and we also need to give confidence to the consumer that when she leaves the store, she can make that same project to a similar skill level with premium quality right. uh, fabrics and accessories and things to go with it. So. The, it, it's not all about price either. It's no, about it's the community spirit and the service because the folks on your floor and the folks in many of the independent stores are a wealth of information, not well. just about the <laughs> fabrics, most of them. I uh, defy you to find a box store <laughs> oh, well. where you can take your quilt up and go, I'm having real troubles figuring out how much border fabric I need and have the employee in that box store say, oh, well, boop, 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 you need this many yards. <laughs> That's another reason why the independent You're store not, is so it's important. It's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or uh, my machine is doing this. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I but, take bets. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, well, so I mean, it's the most important thing is is that we support the the independent fabric seller, and yeah. there are some great online sellers, but yep. there are some fantastic brick and mortar stores and it's worth the drive it's worth coming in to see you know your friends and your your distant associates that you've met right. over the years in quilting uh, and to see the latest and greatest products in our industry we're in a fantastic industry it's a great community uh, many of the vendors are friends with each other away from right. the business um, i hesitate to bring up bad news but i mean in when we had 9 11 many of us vendors were actually all together doing a trade show Oh. And, you know, we all had trouble getting home you right. know, for the next three or four days after 9-11. Right. Um, and like 9-11, you know, the COVID uh, virus, unfortunately, it has been very good for our industry because so many people stayed home. And we and saw... took this back up. A lot of people had really dropped did. this hobby. Yeah. And we saw picked a lot it back of folks up returning. And, and rediscovered it. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that's hugely fantastic news because we want to make sure that this is a continuing craft. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure people get this down in the ages. Well, and also there's a lot of new sewers came into the industry, yes. you know, in March, April, May, who had never sewn before. They are of all age groups. They are of all uh, themes. They'll mm -hmm. do modern and, and traditional and everything in between, batiks. So um, it's a great time to be in, in this uh, hobby. It's a great time to be in the industry. And, you know, in uh, the worlds of World War II uh, yep. cabinets, keep calm and carry on. That's right. <laughs> um, I guess we would say keep calm and sew on. Sew on. And I, you know, I got to tell you, the, the, the quilt shops, support your local quilt shops. They're all over the country. There's 3,000 some odd quilt shops yeah. that are a member of, of a professional organization that I belong to. All 3,000 of them have different things. Every quilt shop has mm -hmm. got its own theme. Yep. So shop hopping, just visiting your local shop, visiting a shop when you're on vacation, 
it's a fun thing to do. Nobody goes to a cult shop because they have to. They go to a cult shop because they want to. Exactly. That's the difference in how much fun it is. You don't have fun at the grocery store, but you have fun in a cult shop. So well, I've had some fun in the grocery store. You yeah. see all the, uh, <laughs> when they give away, they used to give away the free little, little nibbles. Samples. <laughs> they don't do that now, but <laughs> it's more fun to go to a quilt store. So. Uh, yeah, really. Anyway, support your local quilt shops. Indeed. Take a look at this fabric. Um, look at the things that Jeremy has told us about. Make sure you're getting the best bang for your buck and really think about what you're willing to put in a quilt that is going to take you 20, 30, 40, even more yeah. hours to make. What's it worth to you? All right. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. It's a privilege it. to be uh, we here. We learned a lot. I'm glad. Okay. So here we are, good, better, best, a little misnomer this time around. Um, we're gonna talk about pins, and I don't really have any poor quality pins with me today. Um, don't carry them, so I don't have them. But what I have are three different examples of really fabulous pins. So I'm gonna show you, we're gonna start right here. These are magic pins. So magic pins, the head of the pin it's heat resistant, so you can iron over this and it's not going to melt. A lot of your plastic head pins, so if you've gotten your pins at a big box store and they're plastic head pins, please keep in mind you should not iron over them because those will melt. But anyway, these are extra fine on the magic pins. Look at how easily that glides in and it doesn't distort. I mean, it's just really nice. So these are extra fine. And then I've got these nice little pins. These are from Clover. They're patchwork pins, and these are the fine ones. They are glass head. Again, you can iron over them. They don't lay quite as flat as these do, and you don't have as big of an area to pull as you do with the magic pins. So if you have any kind of issues with arthritis or gripping with your fingers, these magic pins are going to give you a better surface to pull out. If you don't happen to suffer from that, and I don't, um, I like to use the glass head pins. That, again, will glide right in and out of your fabric. It's not going to go in quite as easy as that one. This is only a fine. This is an extra fine. The extra fine is going to go in significantly easier. You're not even going to feel it penetrate the fabric. This one, you can feel it penetrating when it goes in. And then these pins, I have a ton of these. I love these pins. These are from Tulip. These are um, hardened steel and they will last a little longer. Over time, your pins are gonna tend to rust unless you keep them in a, um, like a walnut shell or the sand pin cushions to get that surface to keep it clean. The tulip pins will not do that. They will last forever. These again are the fine ones and they're glass head. So they just go right in and out of that fabric. You can iron over all three of these. So all three of these are actually very good pins. That being said, I have a third one I wanted to throw out there. So, you know when you're stitching and you're trying to join seams and you want that seam intersection to match up, and you know how sometimes your presser foot, the pressure on your presser foot will push your seams apart before you get over that intersection? This is a cool pin. This is a U-shaped pin. It's a fork pin from Clover. It's two different pins, one on each side. If you have trouble with your presser foot pressure pushing your seams apart when you want them to match, you can pin with this pin, this U-shaped pin, what you do is you pin your pieces before you stitch them on either side of the intersection that you want to match. So like right here is one, I could pin on either side of this, I can pin on either side of this, and what that will do is make sure that that doesn't shift when you're going across that seam intersection. So that's something you can add to your arsenal, particularly if you are struggling with getting seams to match. Now these three pins, perfect for just pinning your patchwork pieces as you're piecing. Um, they're great for curve piecing, they're great for applique, they're great for all kinds of different um, techniques when you just need a nice, fine pin that's a good quality that you can iron on. So there are some price differences. Uh, the, the tulip patchwork pins, the ones that won't rust over time, uh, 60 of them for $8.99. They come in this little glass tube, which really isn't particularly fabulous for storing them in. You'd probably want to put them in a tin. Then you've got your clover pins. You're going to get 100 of these for $8.99. These are the glass head fine clover patchwork pins. And you get this nice little plastic 
container that they go in. And then you're going to get your magic pens. These are a little more expensive. They're $10.99 for $50 in this particular instance. These are the extra fine. They have that heat resistant flat portion on it and then they come in what I like to affectionately call a little coffin. <laughs> I don't know why they shape that like that. Anyway, all three of them are very nice pins. It just depends on what your needs are. Check them out. Make your piecing easier and less stressful. We'll see you next time. Alrighty, everybody. Now we're going to talk about some fabric and how to read the bolt ends. So Jeremy from Benertex earlier today um, talked to us about how on a digital fabric like this one, you're not going to see those registration circles. So this is a digital fabric. We're not seeing any of those registration circles with the different colors from the screens because this was all printed using electronic methods. So another way you can tell on digital fabric is you're not going to see the dyes coming through to the back of the fabric. So the back of your fabric on a digital print is going to look more like that and less like the print. So there's a digital print. No registration marks. If you're looking to see Let's say you buy some of this fabric and 30 days from now you're like, oh gosh, I'm short a half yard. How are you going to find it again? If you didn't save the selvage, like most of us do, you cut the selvages off before you start cutting and now you don't have the identification. So take a look at the end of the bolt and that will identify. So the manufacturer is Quilting Treasure, so QT. The line name is Cashmere. The SKU or the stock keeping unit is 1649-27106-AS. And that gives you, that's your color number and your style number. So like 27106 is gonna be the same skew on multiple versions of this, the AS will change to different color names. So that's how you identify this particular fabric. Let's look at a batik. So this is an anthology batik. You can tell that because it says anthology, pretty big letters. So anthology batik in particular does not have a line name on their fabrics. They don't print a line name. What they do is they put their stock keeping unit up there. So it's not really a skew. A skew is more one that you can scan. This is more of a, this is just the style number. So this is 814Q dash and eight is the color number. So there's gonna be a bunch of 814Qs and then different numbers for the colors. All right, so here we're looking at a Robert Kaufman batik, and this Robert Kaufman batik does have a line name. It's called Rosette, 18941-201, and then their color identification is actually a word, jewel. So it gets a little confusing because every manufacturer is a little different. Timeless Treasures. This is a print fabric, Timeless Treasures. You can tell it's Timeless Treasures. Now what you don't get is a line name. This was actually from a line. Timeless Treasures does not name their lines with a name. This is just fruit. And the skew is C8016 in color cream. So just get familiar with the end of these bolts and that will help you out significantly. Um, if you shop primarily from one manufacturer, a lot of people really like Moda fabrics. Modas are very straightforward. Uh, because they actually list what each number means. So this is a Moda fabric. It's The Blues by Janet Clare. They have item and then 16902 and they have color 14. So they make it really easy for you. Each manufacturer does a little bit different on the end of their bolts, but they will all have the information you need to get that fabric again in the future should you run out or need it. Good information to keep on hand. When you're out shopping, just take a snapshot with your cell phone of the top of the bolt and then you'll have it in case you ever need that fabric again. Okay, hope you learned something today about fabric, lines, manufacturers, bolts, and identification. We'll see you next time. So thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your viewing our quick little videos and we hope you learned something about fabric and pins and bolt boards today. We'll see you next time for episode eight.